and welcome to WooStream, uh, bringing the Lame It to you. I'm Kendrick Arkaki from the class of 2014, um, and I'm the editor and producer of WooStream. Today's conversation features Tony Peterson, a Willamette undergraduate from the class of 1980. He earned a bachelor's degree in psychology, an MA in Christian education from, from Skerritt Graduate School, and is completing a post-master's specialist in education degree in culture, cognition, and learning process. He's designed and facilitated diversity workshops in corporate, academic, and community settings since 2004. In 2014, Tony began documenting uh, conversations with his grandchildren, Damon, Chelsea, Elliot, and Zoe, regarding race and presented a TEDx talk titled, What I Am Learning From My White Grandchildren, Truths About Race, which has since been viewed over 3.1 million times. Tony's grandchildren have continued to grow up, providing more opportunities and insight into conversations of race into the 21st century. With that, Tony, I'm excited to have you here today, and I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Kendrick, and I am excited to be here. Um, uh, to everyone, uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for months, and um, I, I hope it will be fruitful for all of us. Um, so I want to start with another one of those stories. Uh, well, it was not our intention to make social justice marches a uh, rite of passage for our grandchildren. But in January 2017, just four years ago, almost to the day, uh, my wife, Laura, and I decided to attend the Women's March here in Nashville. And we took Damon along. Uh, Damon was 12 years old, then just a few weeks away from his 13th birthday. And then this summer, uh, we, Laura and I also joined Nashville's March for, for Racial Justice um, right after the murder of George Floyd. And Chelsea wanted to go along. It was just weeks before her 13th birthday. Now, I've told stories about both of them, both Chelsea and Damon, um, in that TEDx, TEDx talk that Kendrick mentioned. Um, and those stories would not have been a, um, uh, they would not have pointed to their activism. So I want to I want to retell a couple of those stories. Um, the first one is is about Damon when he was five years old. And when he was five, he asked his his aunt Lily, his aunt Kimberly, who he calls Lily, um, this question. He said, "Lily, am I black or am I white?" And his uh, his aunt Lily was surprised by the question, and she asked. She answered a little simplistically. She said, "Well, your mommy is white, and your daddy is white, so you're white." And Damon's response was, well, when I grow up, I'm going to be black. Well, Damon wasn't confused by his basic colors. So why would a five-year-old ask such a strange question? He already knew at five years old that it mattered. The Chelsea story was when she was six years old. Um, and it is probably the most controversial story I tell about my grandchildren in, the, in this context. It was the night that her baby sister Casey was born, then 10-year-old Damon and six-year-old Chelsea and their three-year-old sister Zoe were staying the night with me while their parents and grandma went to the hospital for the baby. The next morning I got up and viewed pictures of the baby on my tablet. Chelsea woke up and she saw those pictures, but then she wanted to use the tablet to look up uh, uh, pictures of her, of, uh, from, from the Disney animated movie, Frozen. And she wanted to see pictures of her favorite character, which was Elsa. And she's looking through those pictures and she stumbles upon one that really got her attention. And she said, because this Elsa had dark brown skin and Elsa, uh, Chelsea was not having it. She looked at that picture and she said, what? That's not Elsa. It's black. It's ugly. <sighs> what would you do? She was sitting there practically in my lap, and I sat there frozen. I could ignore it, let it go, let it go. I could say, I could get angry and say, don't say that about black people. But I decided I wanted to hear more. So I asked her, I said, do you think black skin is ugly? Yes, she said. 
And then very quickly, she said, well, not your skin, but Elsa is not supposed to be black. First of all, you need to know that that particular artistic rendering of Elsa was not well done. But what sounded like a racist sentiment, white skin is be beautiful, black skin is ugly, was really nothing of the sort. Um, I had to venture into the discomfort to find out what she really meant. And what she really meant was I've seen this movie dozens of times and Elsa has white skin and a long blonde side braid. Um, that's how I know it's Elsa, unless it's coronation Elsa when she wears her hair up. Perhaps the most important lesson Chelsea taught in that moment was that our ethnicity is essential to our identity. And what followed was a truthful, loving, racial conversation that involved Chelsea, her 10-year-old brother, and her three-year-old sister. There's Damon today, and there's Chelsea today with that baby who was born that night. That's, that's her little sister, Casey. If you've seen my TED Talk, you've heard those stories. I, I have some new ones to tell today. Um, I tell stories about my grandchildren, especially as an entry into uh, more frank discussions about race and, and other issues of diversity and inclusion. Laura and I have Laura and I ha have twelve grandchildren, and ten of them are people we call white, and seven of those have lived in our home home at some time. So we have had much opportunity for for these conversations. All six of our grandchildren, of our white grandchildren, who are currently in schools. Um, have been in race, have been racial minorities in, in their entire, for their entire school careers. Our grandchildren are living in a world much like children across the country where multicultural relationships are more the norm than the exception. Our children and grandchildren, young adults, um, are already living into the multicultural nation that is coming to all of us. And I don't discount their age appropriate wisdom. The children can be our guides. In fact, it was a group of Nashville teenagers, these six girls who are aged 14 to 16, who inspired us to attend the Racial Justice March this summer. Um, we didn't attend their march, but these six young women um, met on social media. They had not met one another before. They met on social media media weeks after, less than a week after George Floyd's murder. And they decided they wanted to do something. So, so on social media, they organized a march um, within one week and within less than a week. And these six young ladies hoped that um, from what they heard on their social media, they hoped that 800 people would show up in, in downtown Nashville. Um, instead, 10,000 people showed up. And when we saw what they did, what they did using social media, using um, digital advocacy, um, that inspired us to at least partake in, in the very next uh, March here in Nashville that, that, that came along. They use the tools that are native to them. And I try to use the tools that are native to me. So as a consultant on my own and with three uh, different diversity, equity, and inclusion fir firms, I try to encourage conversations about race and other kinds of diversity. I speak, I facilitate, I write, I coach, but I am not a traditional activist. I've not organized or started petitions. Um, I remember, I also, I, I, I never have done that. I remember in, in my Willamette days from 76 to 1980, um, there were protests about um, a South African apartheid, apartheid at Willamette. Um, this group, Willamette Coalition Against Apartheid, um, they built a tent city and there were protests on a daily basis. I steered clear. This is not what I wanted for my Willamette experience. And race was not a major topic in um, my Willamette years. A upon arriving on campus in 1976, I was determined to, make, to not make the mistake that I made in high school in Hawaii. In high school, I waited until the last semester of my senior year to involve myself in any outside activities. 
But I vowed at Willamette that, that I would fully involve myself in the college experience. So I do, dive uh, whole hog um, into official social activities. I joined the Hawaiian club. Um, I think these pictures were taken the same day because I'm wearing the same shirt. Um, I joined the Hawaiian club um, because I was from Hawaii. I joined the Minority Student Union, union which properly could have been called the Black Student Union. Um, I wanted to make sure that in my Willamette experience, I found a place to belong. But I think before the first semester was over, I had effectively left both of those groups. I didn't need them. I found belongingness in, in less identity-based activities, and especially in the dorms. For an Army brat who attended 11 schools before graduating high school, I'd never formed long-lasting re, uh, relationships. The four years at Willamette provided my longest relationships outside of my family. Between dorm life, music life, Christian gatherings, I felt at home at Willamette. In preparing for this webinar, I look back at uh, Walula's from all four years, and I look back at my scrapbooks. Yes, I have scrapbooks from those years. Um, I have them 40 years later, um, and they were revelatory. First of all, we were an emotionally, intensely relational and dramatic group. We were, I think what the kids would say these days, emotionally extra. Uh, as I looked at the documents, many of them were handwritten notes. I got emotional all over again. Um, this is one of the notes I received during those days. Um, we had these things called Willie notes, and uh, they came out. They they were they were distributed on holidays, Halloween, Valentine's Day. Um, I think we had some Christmas ones, and they were just an opportunity for people people to say words of affirmation to to friends and we would uh, deliver them through campus mail um, some people would deliver them uh, to to people's dorms and this is one that I got um, you know uh, from a friend uh, will you be mine because you have the patience of a thousand blades of grass they seem to be be patient plants don't you think um, this is just one of those examples of, of just of how how we develop those relationships um, in our time at um, at Willamette, and when I look through the ones that I still have, it was very interesting how many I have from um, well crushes, and there were a lot of crushes, and um, because my crushes had no racial bounds, and because the young women around me were for the most part not African American, I often engaged in this question of interracial relationships. It might seem strange to us in the 21st century, and boy, does that date me, but it was a very real question, especially for my white friends back then. And that question about interracial relationships inevitably culminated in uh, with the statement, well, with the question, what about the children? After the first few times I heard that question, I found it a little bit humorous, but I also I established a standard response, something along the lines of, while, while biracial and multi, multiracial kids have different challenges than black kids, they don't necessarily have more difficult challenges. And the African-American community is used to embracing people of varying hues. I was, of course, uh, very aware of my blackness, and I dared to raise the issue occasionally. But beyond that specific, specific issue of interracial relationships, amongst the singers and other musicians, psychology, religion, history students who were my friends, um, race, to my memory, rarely came up. And I'll maybe rarely will mean something different to my white friends. Some had never had a black friend before me. Some had never had non-white friends before Willamette. There were efforts on campus to expand the ethnic environment at Willamette in those years. I remember speakers, even controversial ones, invited to, to, to address the, the Willamette community. Uh, student groups like, like the Minority Student Union and Hawaiian Club brought activities, and the partnership with our sister school in Japan was an important part of our years. 
But I also, I, as I said, I uh, looked through our Walulas, our yearbooks, and uh, I was thinking I could, could not remember a single non-white faculty member or, or administrator in my four years at Willamette. So I looked back at uh, the yearbook, and you can see here, this, this is a yearbook from my freshman year, 76 and 77. And what I found was that my memory wasn't perfect, but it was nearly so. In the four years, um, as I looked at the faculty pages in, in the yearbook, I found evidence of one African-American administrator and one African-American professor. Each of them, <laughs> it appears, were at Willamette for only one year. And uh, outside of um, one education professor, Ted Ozawa, Ozawa I believe, um, I, I only saw, he was the only Asian-American that I saw who had a, a tenure um, he was the only non-white uh, uh, professor or administrator that I saw who had a tenure in, in those days. As I stated, race was not a common conversation piece, but there were some incidents. In, my, in the second semester of my freshman year, my roommate Mark and I decided we wanted to be big brothers in the Big Brother, Little Brother, uh, Little Brother program. A student named Roger, who I don't remember, but I wrote, uh, uh, I have notes about, uh, a student named Roger uh, was the Willamette liaison. And we, we, we visited him in his room and looked over the files of eager little brothers I chose an eight-year-old white boy named Stephen. Actually, all the children, all the boys in the files were, were, were white boys. So Roger submitted my name and the big brother office approved my selection, um, pending a discussion with Stephen's social worker. A couple days later, Roger contacted me. The office had rejected the approval and to compensate um, they informed me that there was a black little brother that I could select. Um, that, that little brother was not in the files that, that we had previously been given. Um, a series of one-on-one -on -one phone uh, conversations ensued <laughs> in which various reasons were offered for rejecting my application um, with Stephen. He was a shy boy who couldn't handle people differences. Um, they didn't like beginning these relationships with college students in January. Um, continuity prob problems, uh, uh, continuity problems about the summer. Um, Stephen couldn't handle outgoing people. These were the these were the reasons um, for for rejecting my uh, application with Stephen. Uh, when I mentioned that I wasn't very outgoing, I was told, "You have to be outgoing to sign up for this program." Despite, despite, despite those explanations, no one at the organization wanted to take responsibility for the decision. Every explanation pointed to someone else making the decision. But I persisted. I became Stephen's big brother, and I continued in that role until Stephen moved away. I stood up, but I wasn't always so brave. During that same freshman year, I was given a nickname. Intramural basketball had begun, and though I had never excelled in sports, I had long loved basketball. In the spirit of sucking the marrow out, out of the Willamette experience, I jo joined Matthews Hall's basketball team. It wasn't long before my inabilities were discovered. I think the rules of intramural mural stated that, uh, that I had to be allowed to play like one quarter or something like that. Um, we were not a particularly strong team, but um, I was a definite weak factor. Perhaps to cope, um, my teammates came up with the nickname Pearl in homage to Earl the Pearl Monroe, who was a spectacular player in his prime uh, with the New York Knicks at that time. The nickname was meant to be both affectionate and insulting. And from coming from guys who were all taller, wider and richer than me, there was a racial element that was meant to be ironic. I knew all of this, but I accepted the name the way a nerdy 
high school player, a uh, high school kid accepts the semi-positive attention from those we call mean girls. And the name stuck. It wasn't used a lot, but it lasted through my senior year. Even when I had no more in interaction with those who gave me that name, I know this because this name card that you're looking at right now was from my senior year when I was an RA in Lausanne, and this is in my own handwriting. I don't think I've reflected on it in the past 40 years. I haven't agonized, agonized over that insult. It does nothing to mar my rich memories of my Willamette experience. But now I have to review it and think about how, how we use expressions like, it was just a joke, or it was innocent, or boys will be boys, or that's just how it was back then. When we use those phrases to minimize bad behavior. The joke, of course, was that the worst player on our basketball team was the only black guy on the team. My offense or non-offense is not the primary issue. My indignation is not the problem. Sometimes impact goes beyond offense. Sometimes impact goes right to self-worth. What is, is it, um, what is that part of my self-worth that would continue to embrace this insult even when it had outlived its value, which was this validation coming from certain other people. And this is why calls for racial justice are not just about me, my feelings, or my indignation. This is why we should stop talking about the horrors of political correctness. Racist words and deeds come from racist thoughts. We can't directly address those thoughts, but when we control the behaviors, we can influence the thoughts. This is what we saw happen with the murder of George Floyd this su last summer. Mr. Floyd played the unwitting civil rights martyr in juxtaposition to the deliberate violence endured by Dr. King, as well as John Lewis and C.T. Vivian, who we, last, we lost last summer, um, both, both dying on that same day. The violence these men and other men and women suffered for, for their nonviolence eventually got people's attention. Some hearts were changed, others were not. But the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 curtailed behavior, which later changed other hearts. Last summer, we saw a similar pattern. People worldwide, millions, were horrified by the murder of George Floyd. I'm not clear what it meant to some non-Black people. I received contacts from people I barely knew, people who were friends of friends. Some asked for help in understanding what they had just seen. To the, to the degree that I had something to offer them, I was happy to oblige. But many of those contacts were focused on care for me, um, which I appreciated. It felt a little strange to me because my life didn't feel any more vulnerable after George Floyd's murder than before. The world was different for non-Black people, but I don't know any African Americans who saw this event as a watershed moment until we saw the response from others. In fact, I was put, putting finishing touches on a blog post that mentioned the months earlier murder of Ahmaud Arbery when I first heard the name of George Floyd and then the name of Breonna Taylor. And while Arbery's murder was the touch point for the post I was writing, the meat of the post regarded two men who did not die. Travis Miller, the gentleman on the left, and his work partner, Kevin, are the, are the two black furniture delivery workers who were driving out, out of a gated community after making a delivery. They were in a delivery truck marked with the company name. They were wearing company uniforms. They were leaving again the gated community. As they were about to exit the gate, a car pulled up to prevent their exit. The white driver got out of his car and began asking questions, which Travis did not feel compelled to answer. What are you doing here? Why are you here? Where are you coming from? All you have to do is tell me what you're doing and where you're going. In a few minutes, another white man walked up and joined the interrogation. After about an hour, the white man who had received the delivery vouched for Travis and Kevin, and they were allowed to leave. 
what did these men see? What did these white men see when they encountered, encountered Travis and Kevin? Their bias was more than implicit. All they could see is something sinister in two black men leaving the community. And they felt it was their duty to apprehend these men as if, as if their white skin deputized them with the badge of law enforcement. We can get a glimpse of how that mindset can develop. When Ali Michael and Eleonora Bartoli interviewed white, white parents and their white adolescent children about race in 2014, they found that the adolescents learned some things from their parents. They learned black people are lazy, black people are poor, black neighborhoods are dangerous, and black people are physically stronger than white people. They learned this despite the fact there's, that their parents reported teaching their children that racism is wrong. I tried to avoid some of the hot button terms in diversity and inclusion, but this incident re reminds me um, of important realities that we, that we should dive into in our anti-racism. Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt, author of Biased, um, insists that all of us are subject to biases that we aren't even conscious of. When I teach about biases, the first thing I say is that we all have them. But the second important point is that biases can affect our choices, whether they, whether those biases are implicit or explicit, whether they're conscious or unconscious. Dr. Jonathan Kahn, author of Race on the Brain, thinks that too much attention is, is paid to un, un, unconscious bias and that it obscures the reality of systemic racism. Which of these authors is right? For me, the killings and aggravations of 2020 shout the answer. It's both. Although implicit bias is important to recognize and address in ourselves, we must look at how the aggregates of those biases work out in groups, systems, and histories. I think too much of a focus on implicit bias reinforces the false idea that racism and other isms are mainly about individual acts or thoughts when the truth is much broader. The idea, for instance, that black people are somehow more dangerous than other people enters our psyches and enters into issues from law enforcement to school discipline, to housing and to hiring. So let's begin um, to turn towards solutions. I know of Willamette's commitment to social justice and to global issues, but I confess I haven't spent much time following those actions. And my, my recent research did find um, Willamette responses to last summer's incidents. I especially appreciate um, Dr. Eddie Moore Jr.'s 21-day racial equity habit uh, build, building challenge, which was recommended by Jade Aguilar, who was then the Vice President of Equity, equity uh, Diversity and Inclusion at, at Willamette. Um, there are similar challenges to this all over the internet. Uh, I wanna move forward with some specific activities that any of, any of us can do right now. So just briefly, we can get in, get in touch with our own story in regards to race or in regards, in regards to other parts of, our, of our identity. And I'll say a little bit more about that, um, later. Um, each of us can educate ourselves about, um, race, about all kinds of diversities. Um, we should be careful in these racial conversations not to burden people of color, not to, um, uh, not to give bandwidth that they don't have, not to overburden them. Rather than burdening people with questions, educate yourself. Um, listen more than speak. Find ways in your community to integrate. Find ways to serve with people of color or with people who are not like you. And find ways to establish equity. Those are brief um, strategies, but we're, I want to talk a little bit more about some other um, actions we can take. I know that after last summer, many people have grown weary of social action. But 
what are some every day, some other everyday ways to combat racism without burning out? My favorite ideas go back to the children. But before getting to those, I want to tell you about um, sociology, sociology scholar um, Dr. Michael Emerson, who's now at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Dr. Emerson gives his students an interesting assignment. He says, for the next 24 hours, Anytime you refer to someone who is white, preface um, your words with the word white. So if you're telling someone about your professor, say my white professor. If you're talking about your friend, say my white friend. Um, if you're talking about a spouse, say my white spouse. Um, after 24 hours are completed, write a paper about your experience. How did you feel? Was it comfortable or not comfortable? Um, what were people's reactions? What uh, Dr. Emerson has found as he's done this activity year after year is a similar pattern that 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 um, that occurs. And what he finds, oh, he gave them an option. He did give the option to not do the exercise. But if he but if they chose not to do the exercise, then they had to write a paper about why they did not do the exercise. So what he finds a week later when the students report back is that um, some students did the exercise, some did not. When he asked those questions about how it felt, um, generally speaking, the white students had a very difficult time um, either doing the activity, many of them refused to do it, um, or even writing up why this was so difficult. Some, some of them reported that it was uncomfortable to them because it was un uncomfortable to the people they were talking to. Um, but then when he asked to ask people who were not white, um, inevitably they had less discomfort about this, this exercise. They were more comfortable doing it and they, they were able to write about that experience. Um, what that tells us is perhaps they're already comfortable about uh, comfortable seeing that we live in a racialized society. And when I say racialized, I don't mean racist, although there are those elements, but uh, just that we, we, we live in a racialized society. Um, the the uh, researchers, Michael and Bartoli, um, who worked with those white parents and their white adolescent children, um, showed how awkward well-meaning and misguided some of those conversations can be. In addition to those expressions about black people, people that we saw a few minutes ago, the parents reported teaching their children, everyone is the same, race is superfluous, and hard work alone determines how successful a person will be. They also taught their children, do not be racist. And they defined race, racism as overt, violent, and obsolete. Well, we know for sure that uh, racism is not obsolete, um, but we do a disservice when we look at racism as only overt and violent. These parents also taught their children, do not talk about race, do not use the word black and do not notice racial differences. The problem, of course, with this approach is that it handicaps our children, handicaps our young people who, who are trying to navigate the real world, a world where people are treated differently because of the differences like race. When we teach children to be colorblind, we leave them blindsided. Dr. Jennifer Harvey, who authored Raising White Kids, tells us um, that that strategy, strategy is pretty much just the opposite of what parents should be doing. Dr. Harvey's um, philosophy is boiled down in, in this, um, this idea. What she tells parents of white children is to, to help your children notice and name race early and often. A few years ago, uh, seven-year-old Zoe, uh, my granddaughter, uh, spotted Dr. Harvey's book um, as I was preparing for a workshop. 
and she giggled. She said, "Peepa, that's that's my grand my that's my grandpa name. Peepa, people sometimes have funny names for books. This book is called Raising White Kids. That's funny." So I tried practicing what Dr. Harvey suggested. Suggested. I asked Zoe, "Do you know why that book why that book was written?" And Zoe shrugged. Well, uh, I, I tried to explain because a lot of white people think of themselves as normal and of everyone else as different. They don't think about being white. Now, I know you think about being white because you have a black grandfather, and we talk about being black and white. Plus, you go to a school where there are a lot of brown people and only a few white kids, so you can see yourself as normal and as different. And you can see your friends as normal and as different, but a lot of white people can only see themselves as normal, and everyone else as different. That's why there's this book. So here's Zoe at the mall, and、um, she's there in the in the forefront with the book, with her with a different book. And in fact,、um, let's see if you can see this book. I also tried、uh, Dr. Harvey's ideas on a on a different occasion. One of my favorite holiday holiday traditions is to read aloud holiday short stories. So in December 2017,、um, uh, we gathered Chelsea, who was ten at the time,、um, and next to her is Elliot, who who was seven,、um, and Autumn's uh, uh, Elliot's uh, sister. Autumn, and then there's Zoe, and then there's Casey, who was three. And I was reading them a story, Maggie's Gift by Catherine Patterson. The story features Mr. McGee, a lonely and cranky old widower, who agrees to take in eight-year-old, an eight-year-old girl and her five-year-old brother, who who have to vac vacate the children's home on Christmas Eve. As he's on the phone discussing arrangements with. Arrangements with Miss Trainer from the children's home. He asks, he asks her, "By the way, what color are the children?" Miss Trainer says, "They're white. Does it matter?"、Um, and Mister McGee says, "Yes.、Uh, I have to know what color to get the doll. I have to know what color to get the doll." I've read this story aloud on many occasions, but this time. This passage struck struck me, probably because I was read, reading.、Um, I had been reading Dr. Harvey's book, so I paused the reading and and tried to explain to my white grandchildren. When this story was written, I told them most people believe that that white people should only have white dolls, and black people or brown people should only have black or brown dolls. I was secretly amused. That I needed to explain this particular distinction between now and then. Well, Chelsea, at ten years old, picked up the narrative. Yeah, she said. In those days, black people and white people weren't allowed to be together. Like, if you were white and you wanted to marry someone who was black, you couldn't. She walked us through all the forbidden racial marriage scenarios that she could think of, and then she said, "But Martin Luther King came and he he changed all that." Elliot shouted. Oh, oh, oh! I know him. And then Chelsea continued. Martin Luther King said that you can marry whoever you want. The color doesn't matter. It's like chocolate ice cream and vanilla. You can mix them together, and then you have caramel.、Uh, this was not the time to demonstrate how bad that analogy was, but her loving and lovely sentiment came through. She wasn't thinking, "What about the children?" And Zoe chimed in. She said, "My baby doll is brown." I know. I said, "I remember what you named her." I know because the day, day she brought she. I know because the day she brought that baby doll home from、uh, from Dollar General, she introduced us. She said, "Peepa, this is my baby, and she's like you." I named her Moana. I'll call her my baby, but you can call her Mo Moana. She's like you. I was gonna get the white one, but it was too much. I pushed a little bit and I said, "Was the white one the same kind of doll?" Yeah, she said. 
but this one was almost free. The white one was $10. There's Zoe and Moana, and there's the little sister Casey with the fire truck. I gained a lot of insight and a lot of perspective from that conversation with, with the five of them, my grandchildren. It took a, a, a bit of intention, but I think it benefited all of us. It was a practice for children, but it can also work for all of us, um, beginning with ourselves. This is one way, as I said, that we can get in touch with our own racial stories. We can trace our own stories from our earliest memories, name race in our own lives. When did you know you were the ethnicity that you are? Um, and then tra tracing those issues throughout your life, um, what have been moments? Um, what, what is the place of race and ethnicity in your life? The summer has passed. The protests and calls for policy and action were strong. And as you uh, probably know, a few protests are still going on, but not a lot has actually changed for racial justice. And the past three months and the past three weeks have revealed snapshots of who we really are as Americans. Is there an, a just and fruitful future for us? Can anyone lead the way? What about the children? Well, thank you for sharing your personal stories and for sharing ways to, to talk about race um, moving forward. Tony, I want to dive into your background a little bit more. Okay. Um, you mentioned at your time at Willamette, uh, you didn't stay too involved with um, diversity-based groups on campus. Um, and yet, several years down the road, um, you're now involved with uh, creating and leading workshops on diversity and inclusion. How did that get started? Was there a particular event or catalyst or was it just something that kind of developed over the course of years? Well, um, you know, my Willamette years and years following um, were full of opportunities for me to interact with people of different uh, ethnicities, different cultures. Um, a large part of my uh, adult life has been in um, in, in the church world. Um, a large part has been the, in the evangelical church world, and to be honest, in the ev evangelical white uh, church world. And so what I've experienced there is I'm always thinking about these things. I'm always thinking about not just how I am like these people I worship with or these people I'm serving with, but I'm always thinking about how I'm different from them. But in terms of the actual work that I do now, now I was working for uh, uh, the U United Methodist Church for um, for the, the, the overall church. And uh, one of my assignments was to work with a team of people on diversity um, for United Methodist uh, um, staff members. But another one of my jobs was uh, we uh, trained uh, United Methodist pastors who had to have diversity training. So we had um, and I did this several times. We had pastors who would come in on a Saturday morning for all morning, um, many of them who had no desire to do this kind of a workshop, but they knew that they couldn't keep their preaching credentials unless they went to this workshop. And so they would come in um, grumpy. Yes, pastors who are grumpy. Um, and spend four out four hours with me and my coworker, and uh, inevitably they would leave saying, "At least this wasn't a worse a waste of my time." Um, so, so since then, I've taken any opportunities I have to 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 do that same sort of work wherever I happen to be working. Um, and again, um, as you told everyone here, things did change once I got the opportunity to give that TED talk. Um, they didn't change in big ways, but they began to change um, as, as that thing, as that talk uh, was seen by more and more people. Um, and, um, you know, I, I have networked with folks in the past 
four years here in Nashville that have connected me with other folks who do this sort of work. And then, uh, you know, this summer, everything changed again. And so I am, uh, I am busy doing this work. Uh, we have a question from a former coworker of yours from UMPH, uh, okay. Maria Taylor. Um, hello, Anthony. Uh, as an African American born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, and living in Murfreesboro, uh, okay. about 40 miles southeast of Nashville, okay. um, Maria is accustomed to regularly seeing Confederate flags on license plates, in the beds of pickup trucks, uh, on T-shirts. Um, and yet it was still extremely disturbing to see a huge new collection of about 30 Confederate flags, large Confederate flags, um, in the parking lot of local businesses only a few miles away from Maria's home. Um, and this was uh, just after the, the January 6th Capitol riots. Wow. Um, what are your recommendations for helping these <laughs> folks understand um, how offensive and hurtful their uh, Confederate flag displays are when they say it's, it's not racist, it's simply about being proud of their heritage? Uh, Maria, unfortunately, I don't have any recommendations um, in that area. I, I, I really don't. Um, I, um, I'm sure you're familiar, Maria, with the the statue of Nathan Bedford For Forrest out on, on I-65 um, that that we've seen seen for years and years. Um, I think people who have that kind of commitment to that kind of worldview. Um, I, I, I don't have any recommendations for them. There are other people, though, who, um, you know, I, I pride myself in be, being able to turn um, the thinking of people who are not yet that hardcore. And so I talked about these pastors um, that didn't want to come here, you know, Race is not an issue for them. Ethnicity is not an issue for them, but they'll have to do, they have to come to this training because, um, you know, to keep their credentials. Those people I pride myself in being able to win over um, by talking in ways that are different from, from what gets said through um, political discussion, through, through um, uh, press kinds of discussion, those, you know, I, I, I say I, I, I try to avoid hot button language. That doesn't mean I try to avoid hot button issues, um, but the language. So for instance, and I'll just use this, the, the whole idea of white privilege. I believe it exists. I believe it's real, just as male privilege exists. Um, you know, I, I like to tell people uh, in the catalog of privileges, I have most of them. Um, I'm a black man, but I have most of the privileges because I'm a man, because I'm educated, um, you know, also I'm a homeowner. I mean, whatever those things are. Um, but I try to, I try, try not to use the expression white privilege, but, but we can talk about, um, the ways that, um, some people, um, some people's lives lived experiences different from other people's lived experiences. A lot of what we do and a lot of what I do and what I do with the consulting firms I work with um, is to talk about um, the different ways that we are all different. Um, because when we talk, uh, I, I got a question today from someone who said, um, when we talk about diversity, who are we talking about? And of course, the answer to that question is everybody. There is no one outside of that picture of diversity. Um, so there, there are people who, you know, who have been moved by the incidents that happened last summer or incidents that keep happening, who finally say, OK, maybe there's something to this. Those are people that we can win over. Um, people who have established for themselves um, that you know, the rebel flag is their heritage and that I, I, I don't have any advice. I, I, I don't know how to reach those folks. The next question comes from Dave. Uh, can you say more about not burdening persons of color with your questions? So um, th that's a really great question. Um, well, this summer, uh, a lot of the work that I was doing was, was 
uh, with companies who were requesting listening sessions because after the George Floyd murder, um, they had people in their workers in their companies, employees who who re- really wanted the opportunity to process what was going on um, because these were event- events that were new to them and they were disturbing to them and they won and and it, it, it you know it hit them at a really deep place. And so they wanted to know what can we do to think through what I'm feeling, um, but also what can I be doing? In terms of, uh, uh, of the people of color around me, especially the black people around me, uh, can I ask them questions? Can I tell them how much I care about them? Can I, whatever. And one of the things that, you know, what I, th- those first two things on that slide kind of go together. And the first one is educate yourself. And so the list, um, that I've submitted, uh, books. This is just scratching the surface. I actually have multiple lists of books um, for this area. Um, but but so before um, going raw with your emotion to the first black person you see, um, uh, uh, step back and say, how am I going to educate myself? Not putting the burden of that education on random black person. And I say that random black person, I'm in this business. So I volunteered to do this sort of thing. Um, but, but, you know, uh, your black coworker who you've never spoken with before, or you've only spoken with in passing in the hallway, um, has, hasn't volunteered to educate you on, um, what it is to be black. So I would encourage people to find that education elsewhere and then to recognize the nature of your relationship. So you may have a good friend who is African American who, um, who you feel like you could have these sorts of conversations with. Um, w- one way to, to, um, gauge that whole thing is to ask, um, do you have the emotional capacity to answer this question. I've got a question about what happened um, in Minneapolis. Uh, can I ask you that question? And then allow them to honestly say, you know, I, I really don't want to deal with this right now. Um, so that so that they're not bearing that burden um, with all those folks. Great. Thank you. A uh, question from an anonymous attendee, apparently. <laughs> uh, could you define social justice um, and does it differ with other writers or speakers? Um, so I'll be honest, I've never come up with my own so, uh, definition of social justice. And, and that, is a, that, that makes it a really good question. Um, uh, what, I, what I wanted to talk about with this uh, webinar was mainly uh, uh, racial social justice um, because there's a lot of issues of social justice that are not not about race, um, but we didn't have enough time to talk about all of those. So um, I think one way I want to answer this question is um, in the Christian circles that I've been in, um, there's been a lot of talk for decades about the term racial reconciliation. And what that often entails is just this idea that, and, and I know this is overly simplistic, so please forgive me for this, but, but this idea that black people are over here and white people are over here, and can we just get people together and reconcile? And what that idea ignores is the long, long history of racial oppression of, you know, it's a history (laughs) that is very complicated and very long. Um, And so the difference between racial reconciliation and racial justice is this idea that, that um, undoing 400 years of racism um, is going to take a long time. And hopefully it won't take another 400 years, but it's going to take a long time. And we can't just rush to this idea of can't we all get along? We have to acknowledge and address 
um, what has happened through the, those centuries and where we are right now. And so when we talk about racial justice, it's not just about, it's not about sweeping anything under the rug. It's about acknowledging um, where we've come from and the difficulties that have come out of where we've come from. Um, unraveling this thing, it, 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 there, there is not a uh, one stop, stop um, uh, solution to, to these issues. And we see them as each incident comes up, then we say, okay, th there's something else that we need to deal with. When we were, you know, last summer we were talking about racial injustice as it pertains to um, policing. Um, that's just, just one element of, of, of what racial justice would look like. So, so it's really, a, it's a, a kind of a reckoning, but it's, it takes pe people of goodwill wanting to do the hard work of remembering where we've come from and wanting to, to unravel so th those sorts of things. Um, you know, it, it means listening and not getting defensive. Um, it means, I like the expression, um, cultural humility. It means um, uh, recognizing that I walk through the world a certain way and every uh, other priest person in the world walks through the world a different way than I do. I have three siblings who grew up with me. Um, they lived in Hawaii with me. They were, they lived in on military bases with me. Um, but we do not walk through the world identically. Um, and so when we remember that, I mean, that, that should be self-evident, but when we remember that, then we, we can approach everyone around us with a sort of humility thinking, not that they ought to be walking around like I do, but that they, they just walk around like they do. And I can learn from them, I can grow from them, and I can wait on them um, in terms of, of, of just being humble, humble and listening to, to their world. This question comes from Cynthia. Uh, when you provide diversity training to groups, how do you manage the feelings of upset um, that arise when participants may say insensitive and or racist things? Well, um, thank you, Cynthia. That's a good question. Um, it, you know, most of the time that I'm doing this with groups, most of them are corporate groups, they're companies. And last summer, um, you know, I worked with one company. Uh, I actually, they contacted me. I had to take it to, to one of my consulting teams that I work with. Um, they have 400 employees, um, in a, in an association that serves 12,000. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, we only worked with the 400 employees. Um, we were working in, in groups of up to 20 at a time. Um, and we kind of, uh, I think the main issue is when we start those listening sessions, because that's what those were, this was an opportunity to people for, for people to say how they were feeling last summer and what they want to do going forward. And so we set out ground rules. Um, one of those ground rules is, we're not here to debate issues. Um, for those listening sessions, we're, we're here for each person to say um, what they're feeling, where they're coming from, and not for someone else to come back and say, to somehow negate um, someone's feeling. So we just simply have ground rules that, that don't allow that. Now, sometimes people kind of sneak in something and we, we just, we walk around it. Now, I work with um, some coworkers, in these firms who are experts at, at this sort of uh, thing. And so these are not easy um, conversations to have. But for those of us who have done this for a while, who have committed to it, uh, um, we find some ways to get around that. And one of those is, like I said earlier, this whole idea that um, diversity involves all of us. Diversity is not about those people over there. It's about all of us. We all have our own identities. We all have different levels of identity, um, our gender, our, our um, race, our ethnicity, our um, sexual orientation, our, uh, our military or not military status, veteran status. I mean, all, all these sorts of things, where we live, um, our education level, our, our um, social economic level, um, all those are part of our identity. And so when we talk broadly, um, and not just about um, the problem with the black people. 
um, or some other group of people, then it it broadens out that conversation and and uh, and it mitigates against um, those sort of uh, difficult conversation. And, and and when I say difficult, I'm, I mean I those we have difficult conversations, but we sort of frame it in a way way where people are respectful to one another. Um, so that's the best we can do. Uh, a question from Mark. Uh, you mentioned not wanting to overburden people of color in the in this process and leading change. Um, as a white clergy person, I don't want to stand in place of another white guy who has the answers um, and doesn't want to be in the position of always speaking on behalf of persons of color or telling their stories that aren't aren't his. Um, is there a balance, and do you have any advice for that quandary? Mark, Mark, and I um, go way back. Um, I was his youth leader when he was uh, actually begin, beginning when he was in fourth grade. I was one of his youth leaders uh, in a church a long time ago, and Mark's now a pastor and one of my favorite people. Um, uh, Mark, I, I, I'm not even sure. Um, that I have an answer better than what you've already experienced. Um, yes, yes, you need to balance those sorts of things. And I think there's a role for white folks in helping other white folks, uh, um, toward, um, uh, racial justice. When, when I mentioned that I have several different book lists, um, one of those book lists is books written by white folks for white folks um, about uh, race and racial justice. And, and many of those books, uh, um, my favorite ones, as a matter of fact, trace um, the complicity of the church, the American church in uh, um, white supremacy. Um, and these books, again, are written by white folks, some of them evangelical white folks, some of them mainline. Um, one that I have is written by, by a Roman Catholic, so I think there's a role. So 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 my quandary, Mark, is is like yours because when I when I recommend these books, I realize that um, there's also this great um, need to amplify black voices. So there are all these great books written by black authors, um, many of whom um, rightfully got a lot of attention last summer and are still getting attention now. Um, and I love those books. And I recommend those books, but I also want uh, um, the voice of white folks who have who have walked these um, walked with other black people um, to tell their perspective and to give um, to, to give their white experience. A lot of a lot of these authors are mixing memoir with history, with research. Um, um, and I'll mention one right now. Uh, I think this is in the list, Kendrick, that I gave you of those addi additional books. But one is called um, "White White Too Long" by um, by Robert Jones. And uh, Dr. Jones is a researcher. Um, he's a Christian. He uh, I'm not sure he would call himself a um, evangelical today, but he he grew up in the evangelical church. And he traces his own um, Southern background and intersperses that with the research that he does because he's he's a researcher um, and then adds in, in American history. So you have this whole um, three pronged approach of a man, a white man, white man talking about um, racial justice from from his own perspective and from what he's learned. So I think there's a great role for white folks to educate other white folks. Um, um, and it, yeah, so th 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 that's the best I can do, Mark. This next question comes from Sarah. Uh, how would you recommend addressing microaggressions uh, in the workplace as an ally um, in the moment or and as a whole? Um, that's a great question. Um, I know I keep saying that, but it is a great question. And that's another one of those words that I don't tend to use, but it's a concept that 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 I talk a lot about. Um, I don't use the word because people 
um, get put off by the word. Um, so what we talk about, in fact, we talk about um, three, three different situations. One is um, when, when you um, have been slighted in some way, when someone has said something to you um, that was off-putting, um, I don't like to use the word offensive because I think that 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 puts the onus on the offended person. And I, and I don't think that's right. But um, but but when someone said something that you you're going that that was not right, that was hurtful. Um, so we talk about that situation. We talk about the situation where you might have said something and and an hour later you think, oh, I wonder if that was offensive. And then there's that other situation where. Uh, you might have said something and someone actually confronts you um, and says that wasn't that wasn't good. So taking the first one just quickly, um, if someone has um, said something that was hurtful, that was wrong, they used the wrong they used terminology that was that was, um, you know, they should have known not to use. We really tell people um, to to. Uh, decide whether you're going to address it um, because sometimes it might not be worth your while to address it, but decide whether you're going to address it. But when you, um, but if you decide to address it, then we actually tell people count to 10 and think about, um, so you one, that's just emotionally, uh, back up emotionally. You've already decided you're going to confront someone, back up emotionally um, and, and then think through the situation. Is this a one-time incident or is this a pattern of behavior that, that someone has done? Um, you know, ask some questions like that before you approach the person. And then, you know, there's something I learned way, way back. Uh, I think it was even before college, the idea of I messages where, where we, where, where, where we identify the behavior and don't focus on on how hurt we are, but identify the behavior, identify why that that wasn't the best behavior. Um, talk about the impact on you, and um, and then allow that person to apologize, um, and and maybe say where they're going to go next. So the next situation is what if what if I I'm thinking oh maybe I said something that could have offended someone. Um, it's really a, a sim similar approach. Take a, take a breath. Um, that ask that question about, you, you know, when we were talking a little bit earlier, um, I said something thing that might have offended you. Uh, can we talk about that situation? Um, can, will you let me know if that was offensive to you? So that's the second situation. And then the third situation is if someone, um, comes to you and and confronts you about something how do you deal with that again take a breath um key key factor is avoid defensiveness um and and a uh part of that defensiveness is that whole idea between um intent and impact so what we often do in our defensiveness is when you come to me and say, you know, I've said something that that bothered you was not good for you, um, my retort might be, "Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that." Well, you're not meaning to do that matters, but we're not talking about your intent. We're talking about the impact, um, and so the best thing we can do when someone confronts us like that is to take that step back, listen, listen, fully listen not ready to respond, but just to listen and hear what that impact was. Um, um, and then uh, uh, don't get defensive and be willing to apologize. And a, a true apology, you know, we see, we see in public life, all, all kinds of apologies that aren't really apologies. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm sorry if you were offended, um, you know, but a true apology acknowledges um, what you've done, what you've said, um, acknowledges the, the hurt that it might have brought and states, um, apologizes and then states what, what I'm going to do going further. And what we like to say 
with one of the firms I work with, what we like to say is you are not responsible for your first thought, but you are responsible for your second thought and your first action. So if you've been called on the carpet, we, we say to people, if you've stepped in it and someone has said something to, to you, then you can, you can correct that. Um, you can move on, move on from that if, you, if you're willing to, if the relationship matters to you. All right. Thank you, Tony. Uh, one last question. Uh, how can, oh, this question comes from Adrian. Uh, how can Willamette and other schools embed equity and diversity in curriculum rather than specific classes? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, uh, I've said it again, haven't I? Um, that is a great question. And, and uh, um, I'm working right now. I'm working on a, uh, um, a curriculum plan for um, for a ministry team that uh, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, for a ministry ministry program that um, has decided they're training um, pastors, they're training ministers, and they've decided that they want to make sure that um, that equity, diversity, inclusion are a large part of that entire program. And I'm only working on one um, course for them. But I mean, it it really takes um, some folks who are committed to, to, to doing that. Because here's the, here's the reality. Um, as I talked about in the webinar, <laughs> the world is changing whether we like it or not. Our nation is changing ethnically whether we like it or not. Um, and so it behooves anyone who's doing curriculum planning to at least acknowledge that, at least acknowledge that, um, that, that as we're preparing um, students for the future, um, we want to acknowledge the future that's going to be there. And so, so the question of how is, is get some experts involved who know how to do this sort of thing, um, do your research, do your consultation. The person who the person who who recruited me, me to put together put together this course is a uh, Willamette um, um, one one of my um, friends from Willamette. Um, he's a pastor now. He's a professor now, and I'm not sure he had a big arsenal of people that he could draw from. Um, to help develop this kind of curriculum. But I would say find some folks who are already doing a curriculum, doing who have done this kind of work and, and, and work with them. Um, I, I'm willing to do that with some other folks, just like I'm doing it with, with Rob, my friend from Willamette. Um, but um, again, it means doing some of your own study, but then finding people who do um, that kind of work um, through through networking, through um, you know, wh wh whatever your networks are, find those people who people who can work with you on that. Again, Tony, thank you so much for jo uh, joining us today. Um, I hope the audience learned some new things as well. Uh, and before we sign off, uh, I want to give you a little bit of a platform. If you have any last words to share with the group or any cool projects you're working on. Well, thank you, Kendrick, and thank you for all your work with this. Um, everyone, this has been uh, great. I really appreciate your questions. You're, you're sharpening my thinking, and um, and I appreciate that. Um, in terms of a plug, um, I am available <laughs> to um, to help in 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 many of these areas, in, in, including curriculum development and uh, curriculum evaluation. Um, you know, as as uh, as we've said, as Kendrick and I both said, I do this co coaching on one on one. I do uh, corporate training. Um, and if you're looking for that, that sort of thing, I, you know, I do this because I love it. Um, so um, this is uh, Kendrick's question about how did you get into this? Well, I, I, I lived into it and now it's it's most of what I do. So. Thank you for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Kendra.